Well, before we get into the, the heart of today's message, I just want to share a, a quick story with you guys. Um, and it comes recently out of uh, my son, Micah, because he's a, I almost said baby, but he's kind of big to be a baby. I don't know what he is yet. Um, but one day, my, uh, my wife had a, a really rough week, and it was kind of near the end of the week. And uh, she came home. She was like, Aaron, is it okay if I lay down? And as a good husband, my response was, Good, we're listening. Yeah, so yeah, go go lay down. I'll take care of it. I'll put on my super dad cape for a second. And man, did I need it. Uh, I cooked dinner, bathed the kids. Three kids are screaming at me. Levi's doing his rollerblades across the house, um, all while I'm trying to cook and bathe and get all the stuff ready for the day. Um, and eventually, and Holly, I mean, Holly's just snoozing. Praise God for her. She needs rest. She puts up with all four of us males in the house. Um, so we're, we're, we're going through the end of the day. I eventually put the kids down. You know, Holly was eating, and Micah, I mean, he's losing his mind. He is just, he's cutting four molars, and, dude, he is going bonkers. Um, and I've done this with all of my kids when they got to that point as I put them in their car seat, and I just drive, and I just go. And we just, I mean, we'll just, I'll, I'll do the, the interstate loop from Holden to Albany about 15 times, um, you know, until they stop screaming at me. And you, you parents, you get it, like, your kid is screaming. There's nothing you can do to help, and they're just, they just need to kind of go through it. Sometimes I feel like that's us, but that's a different message. Um, and we're just, we're just kind of going through it. And there, there was a moment where he is just losing his mind, and uh, I felt in my, my spirit just to take a deep breath. So, I, I mean, again, parents, imagine the kid screaming because this is important. I just take a deep breath, and when I exhale, God leads me to just say the name Yeshua. So I... Yeshua, and I did it again, and I did it again, and slowly what you, what, what fades is that screaming child, and he's just lulled to sleep, and I'm driving for 25 minutes, so I'm just, I've hit the loop at least 15 times at this point, and what I find is really interesting is even in the, in the chaos, and the noise, and everything else, when I bring in the presence of the Lord, when I called, because I could have, I could have just turned around, I could have screamed, I could have hollered, I could have pulled over, I could have, you know, like I could have done a bunch of things. But God said, "Take a deep breath and speak the name Yeshua over that situation." So this morning, I want you to, and this is going to be kind of scary for some of us, but I want you to, to think about the challenges that you're going through right now. I mean, some of us are just going through what's called the suck. I want you to think about the stress that you're under. Now, I want you to, and I'm not saying think about it. Like I, want you to, I want you to see it. I want you to see the stress you're under, the weight and the pressure of your decisions that's sitting on your shoulders. I want you to think about the things that you are doing that is separating you from God. Chew on those just for a second. We're not going to stay there because God doesn't want us to. But I want you to just stay there for a second. I want you to think about all the times that you failed whether it's in your relationships with people, in your relationships with God. And I want you to think about the times you hurt other people unnecessarily. Now I want you to take a deep breath, and I want you to speak the name Yeshua over them. Speak the name Yeshua over them. Now we're going to leave the junk behind, and now I want you to envision Yeshua in the midst of that thing you just thought of. He's standing right there with you, comforting you in the stressful moments, physically lifting the weight and the burdens off of your shoulders. That he is calling you out by name from the darkness that you're currently in. And then when he shows up, there is light. Because when Yeshua shows up, darkness has to flee. It does not have a choice. It must go. And all the stress and all the sin and all the burdens, I want you to lay them at the foot of the cross. Deep breath. Yeshua. Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for, for sending him to die on the cross for me. Father, I thank you for in the times of the chaos that I get the opportunity to bring your presence into those situations. 
that I am not bound by tradition or by religion, but by a relationship with you. Father, as we continue to move in this service, have your way in us. We give you permission. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, whenever we think of the name Yeshua, what is it that we kind of think of? And for those of you who don't know, historically and biblically, Jesus' name isn't like Jesus. I used to think it was weird when I read the Bible as a kid. You'd read about like Abimelech and Hezekiah and Zechariah, and then there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> and I thought that was strange to me. I even thought it was strange that I thought Jesus' last name was Christ. And then, <laughs> I know I'm not the only person who'll play with me. <laughs> But I thought that was interesting. And then kind of as I'm spending time with God, I realized like, yeah, okay, his name is not, his last name isn't Christ, but it's something that he is, like he is the Christ. But when you think of the name Yeshua, what are you reminded of? Are you reminded of, of a savior as someone who redeemed you and paid the cost for you in the midst of the darkness? Is he your good shepherd, the one that left the 99 for you? Yeshua has many meanings to save, to deliver, to rescue. But I think for me, one of the most significant definitions is that his names mean salvation. Biblically, whenever you name someone something or someone is named something, it's, it's a town or a place or who they are. But it's not just their name, but it also speaks to their, to their calling or to their future. Now, parents, I caution you with this, and I'm really glad I don't see this in 2024. Um, we don't have a bunch of, like, Goliaths and Jezebels running around. Um, so it's important to name your kids, like, the good Bible characters um, or just something that God speaks over you. And I'll, I'll use my children ki as, kind of as an example for this. So I have three wonderful boys. So I have Levi Jude, and his name means joined in harmony or to praise. And if you've ever seen Levi, that boy is singing, hit a little, hit a little heart out. It, he gets it from me. doesn't always sound great, but it is a sweet aroma to the Lord. Cyrus, my second child, Cyrus James is his name, and it breaks down as an heir, one who closely follows. And then I have Micah, Joel, and his, his is cool. I mean, the other two are cool, but his, his is neat. Micah Joel is who is like God. Yahweh is God. So hopefully when my children develop a relationship with the Father, they also walk in to what their destiny is, their purpose is. That is not defined by us and what we want out of life because those things are kind of shallow. But what God's determined their purpose is, what he determines their value as. Now we're going to look at some of these verses verses and we're going to take the name Yeshua which means salvation and I want you to see how it translates we're going to see this in Psalms chapter 40 verse 16 but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you may those who love your salvation may those who love Yeshua say continually great is the Lord which we did this morning in worship amen Psalms chapter 51, verse 12, it says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of Yeshua and uphold me with a willing spirit. I want you to see this because this is how my brain kind of translates this. So I have Jesus who is the Christ. Again, last name is not Christ. If you didn't know that, sorry to burst your bubble. I'm glad you learned something today. So we have Jesus Christ and then we have his biblical Hebrew name, which is Yeshua HaMashiach, which is just the Messiah. Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. And both of those things, when translated, means anointed salvation. Jesus was not just a great teacher or just a prophet or just, you know, a real stand-up guy. But he is divine. And he came here for a purpose. And that purpose was to, to break all of the, the boxes that we tried to put God into. And he just wants a relationship with you. So today I'm going to challenge you with something. Whenever we look at the, there are so many things that Yeshua could be in your life, but we're going to look at three. But I, I'm going to challenge you with this. Because even the demons believe, and the Bible says that. And I, okay. Sometimes I don't think we really revere God as much as we should because when God shows up, even the demons shudder. 
and they, they, there's a reverence there where they're understanding that they are in the presence of the Almighty. And sometimes if we're not careful, we just kind of, eh, okay. And I'm, I'm going to caution you with that. But we're going to look at three aspects and not just three titles because it's also who he is. That first one is going to be Yeshua, my Savior. I'm going to caveat with this because sometimes, and I've, I've done this with people, I'll try to piggyback off of where other people are at in their walk with God, and I'll just take that their revelation for my own. For those of you and your parents have been completely devoted to God from your birth, you cannot piggyback off their salvation. Their salvation is not going to get you into heaven. How much they read the Bible has nothing to do with your lack of reading the Bible. God wants an individual relationship with you. And that might look different than it looks with your parents or with your friends. So whenever we look at the, the, the three characteristics, who Yeshua is, I challenge you with everyone. Is he your savior? But here's the question is, what do I need saving from? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Let's look at it. So one, and this is something that makes some of us uncomfortable, and it's okay, but it's also still part of the truth, is we need saving from God's wrath, which is not, tem like, what's the word? Temperamental. It's not just how he feels, but it is just. If you've ever looked at someone and they've done something bad to you and something bad happened to them, and your response is, well, they got what they deserved, you also will get exactly what you deserve. On the final day of judgment, you will get exactly what you deserve based off of your relationship with God. It's important that we do good things, but your good things are filthy rags when compared to Jesus. And we see God's wrath all throughout the Bible. We see it with Pharaoh and the Israelites. We saw it in the, in the promised land against God's enemies. But also don't forget that Israel as a nation who is God's chosen people were not spared when they strayed away from him. They got an equal portion of God's wrath. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans chapter 5 verse 10, Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And Pastor Randy touched on this last week. In verse 10, it says, for if while we were enemies, because there's a point where you're living life and you're standing against God. You're seeing the, the armies of the living God and you're on the opposite side of that. I tell my youth kids all the time that you want to be on the right dodgeball team. Because guess what? When that match starts, one side is very clearly going to win and one side is very clearly going to lose. But there was a point in time where you are enemies. But God sent his son so that you may cross over that threshold. You can switch dodgeball teams. And you can walk in victory, not just in the end. And I, I, I feel like sometimes we just miss so much of, of what God has for us. Because we're only focused on when I die and get to heaven. Then everything's going to be great. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God doesn't want us just to live a poor, pitiful life of suffering and persecution and just turmoil and then get to heaven. It's all great. Like, that's part of it. But God wants us to live here, not just be alive. The rest of that, I'm going I'm to start over at verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, Shall we be saved by his life? You need the blood of Yeshua. Let me make that very clear. You need the blood of Yeshua. When the Bible says that there is no condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus, doesn't mean that the sin is, is, is gone. You still remember it. But it has no power over you. And there is, there is something there that is just so wonderful. I'm not bound up by shame. There's some regret. There will be. But that sin does not have power over me. The second thing we need saving from is separation from God. 
We all know that sin is the thing that separates us. Yeshua does not get rid of the sin, but it is by his blood that we can overcome that sin. Not by our own strength, but only by his strength that is in us. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 through 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ears dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sin, your transgressions have made a separation between you and God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. How many times have we, we kind of strayed from the path and at some point we're like, God, I don't hear your voice anymore. And it's not God that's left you, but you look at God and you're like, mm, deuces. And you leave and you leave and you leave and you leave. You're clinging to the promises that I will never leave you or forsake you, but you've left. And you've created a distance between you and God because of the sin that is in your life. John chapter 14, verse 6, and said, And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In your life, there will be people to tell you that you can, you can, you can get to Jesus in any other way. You can get to heaven in any other way. There's not. There's a path of righteousness, and there's the path of damnation. Those are your two options. There's no middle ground. And we would love for there to, to just teeter the line. But if I'm teetering the line, then I'm, I'm walking away from God. Now, what's interesting about this verse in John, Jesus is not saying, I know the truth. I know the path that you have to take. I have the answer He's saying, I am the path. I am the solution. I am the truth. It's not just knowledge that he has, but as we looked at earlier, it's part of who he is. If he is your savior, then he is the truth and he is the life. If he is not your savior, then you look at Yeshua and you say, hey, that's a potential. For us, if we want to really say that we have a deep relationship with the Father and with the Son, he has to be my Savior, my Yeshua. The second thing we're going to look at today is being Yeshua, my Redeemer. That sin that we kind of looked at, that's separating us and costing our eternity. Romans says that the wages of sin is death. Now, when I think of redeem, I think of the coupons, which I don't really ever redeem coupons. <laughs> Sorry. But I want, you to, I want you to take this just into consideration. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says this. In him, being Yeshua, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Redemption has everything to do with freeing either slaves or prisoners. When I live in sin... I live in bondage. I live as a slave. And if I'm so entrenched in my sin, and this was me at a time, it controls my thoughts. It controls my actions. And I see it as there's no other way out, that I have to do that thing because I have no control. And I'm telling you that is a lie. You may not have control, but you have the choice to surrender. You have the choice to say, Jesus, break these chains off of me and help me to leave them when I'm walking in the, in the direction you have me to go. The price paid for our redemption from bondage, from sin, was costly beyond measure. It was the very lifeblood of Christ himself poured out on his death on the cross. I want you to think about this just for a second. Because we look at we look at Yeshua dying on the cross, and there 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 should be some sorrow there in us. But I want to ponder this just for a second. I want you to think of your your best friend. It can be your mom. It could be your dad. It could be it could be that person. I mean, they are they are your ride or die. I want you to think of your children, just for a second. Whether they're older or they're younger. And now you've been convicted of a crime and the penalty is death. 
And before the judge can slam his gavel to deliver his verdict, whoever that person is for you is saying, wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. I'll pay it. So in my brain, whenever, whenever I'm reading this, I, I'm, I'm seeing my wife, I'm seeing my children, and they're saying, Holly's saying, Aaron, don't worry. I know you're guilty. I'm choosing to take your place. Levi running up to me, dad, 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 I get it. I know you're guilty. I, I understand. But I love you that much to take your place. For us, that is Jesus. Before the verdict is given, Jesus is saying, no, I'll take your place. And some of us see him as a stranger. So why would a stranger willingly give his life for me? Because he thinks you're valuable. He thinks you're worthy, even if you don't. Because he sees something in you that you either have never seen or that you've forgotten. There is an eight value in you. Because you are made in the image of God. You may not be living like it right now. We have all this fog, all the things in the mirrors that we see. But I'm telling you that when the Father, when Yeshua looks at you, he sees value. He sees worth. He says, I will gladly take your place. And I will be sentenced to death because I love you. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 through 14 says this. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. God's action on behalf of his people does not stop with the deliverance. But he also doesn't just leave us. Hey, you're free. Good. Go. Go do your thing. But once he redeems us, he gives us a place. He gives us a home. He gives us clothing and shelter, a place where we not only can live, but can thrive in his kingdom. Those of us, we have parents that have done a lot of damage to us. So then we, when we look at the father and we say, well, if my father treated me like this and I want nothing to do with God, your father and your father in heaven, not, not even the same. They're not. So when our heavenly father says that you are beloved, then you are beloved. Even if you don't see it in yourself. Because that is who he is. And that is who you are. Some of us try to act more beloving. I don't even know if that's a word. But some of us try to act more like, God, God, God I, I just, I want to do more. I want to do more. I want to do more. And it's not the doing, it's the being. And Pastor Randy, if you haven't been listening in the last couple of weeks, I mean, just be. Stop doing, but just be. So when I'm looking at Yeshua, my Redeemer, I have to stop trying to do all the things that I've done to redeem. I just need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 through 9. If it, yes, sorry. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 through 9 says, For once, past tense, you were darkness. Once you lived in sin, once you were enemies of God, once you were separated from his presence, I love this, comma, but, that is, this is now the presence. I was once all these things, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of life consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. I get so mad. Oh, it burns me up. I'm using the term Christians just as a, as a broad thing. But it, it gets me so mad when I, the world does it because they don't know no better. But Christians, we should. It gets me so mad when Christians always try to constantly remind other believers of their mistakes. Oh, remember when you did that, so you did this, or you said that, or you did blah, 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 blah. In your past life, in your BC days, and whatever, all the things that you used to do. I, would, I, I, I hate it whenever people look at me that way based on the actions I used to make because I'm not that guy anymore. Like that guy's dead and he, he's going to stay dead because I'm not going back to that. 
So I am now a child of light, and I'm going to walk in the light. Does that mean I am perfect? No. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stop striving for it. Because it's a worthy goal to be as close to Yeshua as I possibly can. I am no longer those things. I am on the journey to better myself, for my family, for my future generations, and for the people that God has put around me. I walk as a child of light. Isaiah 44, verse 22. Oh, praise God. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud, and your sins are like the mist. And I think this is a command for some of us. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Some of us, you're in a situation, you're feeling the pressures of life, and you're saying, God, I don't feel worthy of your redemption. I don't have any value. I don't have any purpose. I don't have any of these things. And I'm just in the suck. And God's like, return to me, because I've already paid the cost. I've already paid the price. Return to me, because I love you. You're my child. You're my beloved. Return to me. For I have redeemed you. I've paid the cost. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says, But now this is what the Lord says, and I want you to hear this. He who is your creator, Jacob, and he who forms you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I want you to chew on that. I have called you by name. You are mine. Sometimes in life we make the decision to, to I want to ab abandon all others and I want to follow Christ. And at some point, our past decisions try to, to come and make its way in us again. And I want you to see this. I want you, I, I wanna, I want you to feel this. When those things return, it is me. And I'm looking at all those mistakes. I'm looking at all those sins. I'm looking at all the darkness. And it is encroaching to me. It is, it is making its way closer and closer and closer. And the enemy is demanding my life back. But Jesus is the buffer that stands between me and the sin that I used to be in. And he says that I have called you by name. Don't worry. You are mine. And he's declaring that to me. He's like, you can't have this child anymore because they're no longer yours, but they are mine. And some of us, some of us, when we look at the former life and we think of the what ifs and we don't let Jesus stand between us and fight for us, but we miss that world. We want to be back in that world. The depression, the anxiety, the stress, the turmoil. There's no hope. There's no joy in that world. There is happiness and it's fickle. And it comes and goes like the wind. When the enemy tries to, to, to get you back, I want you to remember you have been paid with a cost and you are his being Yeshua's. And I would pray and hope that you would have a really hard time looking back at the, the former you and being like, yeah, I want that. Because what he has for you is so much better. The last thing we're going to look at today is Yeshua, my shepherd. And I'm going to give you a translation of Psalms 23 that you probably haven't read before, but I find it really interesting. Adonai is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Nothing. No wants, no desires, no things of this world, no materials, no positions. Because he has provided for my every need. And some of you are sitting here saying, Aaron, pff, I lack a lot. There's a lot of things that I don't have. I want you to weigh those things. The things that you think you lack Weigh that with Yeshua as your shepherd. I can tell you what I think the scales would say. Because that's the scale of my life. And Yeshua will always outweigh the things of the world. Always. That's for me. 
I can't make that decision for you. It says, he, lie, he has me lie down in grassy, grassy pastures. He leads me by quiet waters. He restores my inner person. I was meditating on just the message today, um, and sometimes randomly cable pops up on our TV, which is weird because I didn't think I had cable. And the Animal Planet came on, and I, and I watched all of these, these African animals, and it was cool. Levi thought it was boring. I thought it was interesting. And I'm watching all of them. And you know what all of them need? Water. They can go so much longer without food than water. And what's interesting is they always find the stream. They always find the river. They always find the water. And before they can drink of that water, they have to bow down. They have to bow down. We have to bow down to the rivers of living water that is our life. That way when we partake in it, it can refresh us and it can restore us and it can continue to sustain us. And as a good shepherd does, continuing, he says, he guides me in the path for the sake of his own name. Even if I pass through the dark, the death, dark ravines, I will fear no disaster for you are with me. Your rod and your staff reassure me. You prepare a table for me, even as my enemies watch. You anoint my head with oil from an overflowing cup. Goodness and grace will pursue me every day of my life. And I will live in the house of Adonai for years and years to come. In John chapter 10, verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. Yeshua is fighting for you, even when you can't see it. Even when you don't feel like it, he is fighting so hard for you. Parents, for you have, some of us have children that have kind of strayed away. You are fighting a lot for your kids. And I'm not taking that away from you. But I want you to magnify that by infinity about how much God is pursuing after them and how much God is fighting for them. If you love your children that much, just imagine how much the heavenly father is pursuing and loving after your children. Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. That is not I am aware of. That means I know them on the deepest level. Just as the father knows me and I know the father he doubles down on this. I lay down my life for my sheep. I am willing to stand in the middle between you and what you once were. And I'm willing to fight. This reveals the type of relationship that we need to have with Jesus. It's not enough for us to know him as Lord. But we have to know him on the deepest levels. Keys, y'all can go ahead and come on up. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Jesus, look at all the things that I've done for you. I've done this and I've done that and I've done this and I've, 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 I've cast out demons, I've worked miracles, I've built churches, I've done, I've prophesied, I've read, I've led small groups, I've done all of these things. Well, that's great, but you're putting the value of your things and you're stacking it up against yourself. But in the doing, you forgot to be. And Jesus' response to them I would, I, I, this is one of the things that I fear. And Jesus' response, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I don't know who you are. You say you did all these things in my name. I don't know you. I don't know you on the deepest levels. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness I think it's very interesting how young my kids are because there's times where I get to return to parts of my childhood and we're watching the Lion King the other day don't laugh but we're watching the Lion King the other day and I'm, I'm 
I'm watching it, man. And I'm looking at Mufasa, and I'm like, what a great dad. I mean, he, dude, what a great dad. And then I watched Simba kind of run away and not listen to his dad. We've been there. We've been there. Amen. We've been there. God says, hey, don't go there. And we're like, but I want to go there. And what's interesting is Mufasa tells him not to go into a place that is, is known as the, the elephant graveyard where there is nothing living. It is, it is desolate. There is no life there. It is just ravaged. Mufasa says, don't go there. Fleshly, Simba's like, I'm going to go there. And he gets chased by things that are trying to consume them. The hyenas. In my brain, I'm seeing the demons that are trying to consume me because at some points I was Simba. And they've cornered him and they've trapped him and he, he ain't got nowhere to go. And then Mufasa shows up. The father comes in to save them. And how do the demons react? Mufasa. And they're shuddering and they're terrified and they're scared. Because when the presence of the Lord shows up, demons have to shudder. They have to bow. They know that they cannot compete with the father. So in your life, and I, and I want you to hold on to this. Your father is trying to save you from the things that are trying to consume you. Some of us, we need saving. I mean, you, 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 you see it all around you. You are living in a desolate land. Nothing is working for you. Nothing goes right. Every time you, you, you get a little extra money, something breaks, and you're, you're, you're in this constant cycle of the suck. And it's hard. And you feel like you're on your knees and you have nothing left to do. And you see everything around you is the enemy trying to tear you down. I want to encourage you in this. If you feel surrounded by the enemy, understand that the, the, the living army of God is surrounding your enemies. So where I am here and I am defeated and I see my enemies, look up because the army of the living God is surrounding your enemies and you will not be overtaken. You will not be conquered. In your strength, you feel defeated. But I don't live in my strength. But I trust my Father will follow through with protecting me and fighting for me. Some of you feel as if you have no worth, no value. You define your life and define who you are by your mistakes. I want you to understand and I, 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 I can only want it for you so bad. I understand that Yeshua has redeemed you. That he's given you value. That he deems you worthy to be loved. To be forgiven. And he is calling you out of that place of the darkness. And he is welcoming you home. Disregard your rags. And leave behind your sin that's separating. And dwell in the house of the Lord. Some of us, sometimes, if we're honest, we feel like sheep. And we're just kind of wandering. But there's a reason that he is known as the good shepherd. And when the sheep wander, it's his job to try to rein them back in. And we feel like we're just kind of going through it. I'm just trying to make it to the next day the next paycheck, the next month. Some of us are just waiting for the next bad thing to happen. There is so much more to life than the next day or the next paycheck. Are you anticipating the bad? How about you start anticipating the good that God is going to do and just thank him in advance. We sang it this morning about being grateful. God, I'm not just grateful for the things that you're doing or the grateful for the things that you've done, but God, I'm grateful for the things that I haven't even seen yet because I know you're going to provide. Today, you have a chance to respond. And sometimes we are so quick just to check the next box or do the next thing in a day. And sometimes we just need to, we need to slow down and process and chew on and meditate what God is doing in us. 
And I promise you this, if you were listening today, God is doing something in you and he's trying to get your attention. All God needs from you today is that next step. Regardless of, of how insignificant you think it is, God is waiting for the next step. We're going to go back into a, a time of worship. And this is your chance to respond. I'm not going to pigeonhole you into coming to the altar because God is omnipresent. He can meet you right where you are. But if you feel led, then come to the altar. If you want to just be where you are and kneel, then do that. If, if you're that person who's like, ah, I don't know if I like worshiping out loud because people are going to think what I, they're, they're, they're going to judge me based on what I sound like or my image I have to uphold. You don't do it for them. You do it because God is worthy of being praised. In this time, if you just want to sit and listen, then so be it. But the worst thing that you can do is nothing. Because God is knocking on your heart's door and he is giving you an opportunity to respond. If you are so overwhelmed with how grateful you are with, with what God is doing in you and you want to worship, by all means, do that too. The worship team is going to be up here and they're going to lead us. God is calling you by name. How will you respond?